Hi guys, this is AJ Barnard, the park naturalist over at Potomac Overlook Regional Park. I'm joined today by Matt Felperine, the roving naturalist who's recording right now too. Um, and we wanted to share uh, some animals with you guys today. So I wanted to give you guys a um, kind of rundown of my personal favorite animal, not just the ones that we have at the Nature Center, but just favorite animal in general, and that is the common snapping turtle. So our snapping turtle here is named Shelby. I'm sure you guys could probably put together why we call her that. Not very creative with our names, but she is our resident common snapping turtle, and she's also the largest one we have. So at the Nature Center, we have a painted turtle and three box turtles. All the turtles are native to this area and to Virginia. She is by far the largest. Um, and that's even more impressive in the fact that she is not a full grown snapper either. Um, we estimate that Shelby is probably between five to 10 years old. So she at most is a sub adult right now. Um, but even at her smaller size, she still easily dwarfs any turtle we have. Um, this is not only the largest turtle in Virginia, it's also the largest reptile in Virginia. So the species can get up to 24 inches long or more from head to tail. In perspective, that's probably about this big. It can get even larger than that. The carapace, the shell length, can be about this too. There's been recorded cases of snappers having shell lengths that are over 20 inches too. Hers is probably eight inches at the most, so this is a turtle that can get far, far bigger too. Um, the adults can easily weigh over 30 pounds when they're full grown too. Um, it's a species that can live for 50 years in the wild, uh, potentially even longer in captivity. So she's currently living in a 200 gallon tank, but luckily enough for us, if she keeps getting bigger, we might need to upgrade soon too. But for now, she has more than enough space in there. She easily has the largest tank in terms of aquatic animals we have here, um, and she's going to get even bigger. So the reason this species is so fascinating is because of how hardy they are. So. Sapping turtles are pretty well known for being really resilient creatures and also pretty, pretty well defending themselves too. So obviously their name comes from the fact that they are more prone to biting than other species of turtles will. And that's actually because while the carapace, the top part of the shell of this species, looks pretty standard to most other turtles you would see, the plastron, which is the bottom part, kind of the belly of the turtle, is very, very small. So you'll actually get to see this when we take her out and get a good look at her. But you'll see the carapace on top is much, much larger than the plastron on the bottom. So a lot of your other species of turtles, if they're feeling scared, will tuck in, hide into their shell. Our box turtles here are famous for doing this. They'll go right in where you can't see any other part of their body. The snapping turtle though, if they get scared, they can't really tuck in. They can kind of hide their arms and their legs, but their head and their neck are just too large on their body to prevent them from fully tucking in. And because the plastron is so small, they can't pull their limbs all the way in either. So they're more exposed down there. So unlike other turtles that their main defense might be hiding in their shell, their main defense is going to be their bite strength. So this species actually has a fairly similar bite to what um, you might expect from an average human. An average adult, we might have about 100 pounds per square inch of bite force. A full grown common sapping turtle might hover around that range, might be a little bit higher too. Really the main reason their bite is gonna feel a lot worse is because of the type of mouth they have. While we might have teeth, and while you do have incisors that are meant for cutting, and we have our molars for grinding, snapping turtles, like all other turtles, do not have teeth, but they have a beak. Um, and their beak is very, very sharp. So theirs almost acts like a scissor, so that when they bite down, it's like a pair of scissors shearing something. So anything that's unfortunate enough to get caught in those jaws, whether it's a small animal, finger, God forbid you put your finger in there, um, but it's definitely going to do some significant damage. So not only is that a great defense on their part, but that's also how they eat too. Um, you'll get a good look when we take her out. They also have very large claws on both their front and hind limbs. Um, those are primarily used for digging, but they're also great for tearing at their prey. So if they're trying to eat something that's larger than what they can just swallow whole, they're also going to use their claws to try to rip away to try to get into smaller chunks. Um, because these animals do not have teeth or molars like we do, they can't chew their food, they have to swallow their prey whole. Now you might be thinking, what does a snapping turtle eat? Now, when she's this size in the wild, it might be things like small fish, small frogs, could be aquatic vegetation too, they are omnivores, so they do eat, eat, do eat both meat and plants. Um, when they're full grown, the easy answer is whatever they want, essentially. If it's an animal that inhabits their habitat that is smaller than them, that they can get into smaller pieces, 
chances are that there's a potential for that animal to be on a full-grown salmon turtle's menu. So just like we said, larger fish, larger frogs, this can include snakes, it can include things like ducklings. I've seen aquatic birds that have been eaten by salmon turtles. Um, this can also include other turtles too. So that's a little known fact about sappers, they're also capable of eating smaller aquatic turtles. So in their habitat, they share their habitat with things like musk turtles, um, painted turtles, other types of water turtles, including smaller sapping turtles too. So they are also cannibalistic. Um, they exhibit very little childcare. So if a young sapping turtle inhabits the same water source as its parents, the parents might not recognize it in a year or so. So that's another potential food source. What they do with smaller turtles is that they will just swallow the whole animal whole, assuming that they can get the shell down their throat too, and they will digest the entire animal with their strut stomach acid. So their acid is very, very strong. Um, there's been rumors that it can dissolve fish hooks, that they can actually swallow metal and have some of it dissolved in their system. So incredibly strong stomach acid, the reason being, unlike us, when we're eating around our meat, we're not swallowing any bones, they're gonna swallow every part of that animal, including the shell, and we'll need to digest it as well, too. So you'll see when we take her out, you'll get a good look, chance to look at her. Um, but in order for us to feed her, she actually needs to be in the water, too. So the sapping turtle has a really long neck that's designed to kind of flip out, grab its prey, bite, defend itself. It has a really far reach, and we'll kind of see what that looks like, too. Um, the downside is those muscles that are meant to extend and retract the neck kind of take away from our throat muscles that help push our food down. So you'll see that this turtle, although she can go out of the water just fine, just like every other reptile, she breathes air just like we do. She just holds hers for a while. Um, for in order for this turtle to eat, she has to be in the water. So just like us, when we're eating something and we take a glass of water and we use it to wash the food down her throat, she does that too, just to a greater extent. She needs it in order for that food to be washed down. Um, so this animal is not picky with its food. Um, typically in this type of environment, in our area, an aquatic animal like that is probably going to be an apex predator too, which is gonna to be top of its food chain. Um, we're talking about how resilient they are too. This turtle has a very, very broad range. Um, you can find it all along the east coast of the United States. It goes out into the Midwest as well. Don't really find the common snappers on the West Coast, but this is a pretty easy species to find around here. Um, one of the reasons the range is so far too is that they are amazingly cold tolerant as well. Um, probably all of us know this about reptiles. During winter, you don't see a lot of turtles, you don't see a lot of snakes. Reptiles typically are not cold tolerant. Um, they're typically gonna be dormant, hibernating. This animal hibernates too, but it's able to survive in very, very frigid temperatures. Um, you can even, and I've been lucky enough to see this too, during the winter in ponds or waterways that are frozen over, depending on the time of year, you can still see snapping turtles swimming underneath the ice while the rest of the pond is frozen over. They're still going about their normal activity, they're still looking for food, they can hold their breath for a long time and are amazingly cold tolerant. So it allows them to go into a species range that you don't see from too many other reptiles too. Um, they can go as far north as Canada, if you can believe that. So amazingly cold tolerant animals, really, really hardy. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna take her out. You guys are gonna get a quick look at her and then afterward we're gonna feed her too. All right guys, I got Shelby here. So this is our common sapping trail, the residential sapping trail we have at Potomac Overlook Nature Center. Um, this is something that you don't get to see too often, hopefully not too often, a person holding a common snapping turtle. Obviously, as to what we talked about, this is not the best idea. would not recommend doing this in the wild. We'll kind of talk about if you had to, how you would do that too. But essentially, how I'm holding her right now is I got my hands underneath her shell right now, so I'm holding her on the plastron. Um, this behavior you see from her too is pretty typical of a snapping turtle. Obviously, they don't prefer being out of the water, so we're only gonna keep her out here for a minute or two before we put her back in. But the way I'm holding her right now, I got my hand on top of her shell on the carapace. I have my bottom hand on her plastron. And by doing that, I ensure that she's not able to bite. So even though this animal does have a very long reach and she's still able to claw me, as you can see right now, um, the way I have my hands positioned are out of her bite range. So even if I were to put my hand on the side right here, which thankfully I trust her enough not to do it, but she could bite there too. So about halfway back the shell is where she's still able to bite. So like we mentioned, she is only about five or 10 years old. Um, she probably only weighs 
about five pounds right now. She can get up to 30 plus. Um, there's been snappers recorded that can weigh over 50 pounds, so might still have a lot of growing left to do. Um, she's probably about 14 inches long right now too. When she gets to be full grown, um, her shell alone will probably be about the length of this turtle. Um, even though her neck looks very small right now too, um, if I were to put my finger out to here, she would still probably be able to reach it from there. Um, luckily, she's used to us enough that she is not really prone to biting. Um, obviously, if you handled her too, too much, she might change her mind, but outside of her kind of doing her thing when she first comes out, she actually settles down pretty quickly too. So you can also tell this is a snapping turtle that's more used to people than just a wild one would be, just because she does get to interact with us and we do get to work with her pretty frequently and feed her. Um, like we mentioned, this animal, because it gets so big in the wild, once they're full grown, they have almost no natural predators, um, especially in this type of area where we don't have a whole lot of large carnivores. So they really do get left alone, really except for by people. So um, you've probably heard of turtle soup before. That's primarily this species, at least on the East Coast, you know, especially more South too. That really is probably the biggest reason that this animal might be in any sort of trouble is just because it's a commonly used species for certain types of food and delicacies too. Um, but otherwise, this animal is eaten by very, very few creatures in the wild when they're full grown too. Oops, so she gave a little bit of a snap there too. So we're gonna be putting her back in the water in just a second also. Um, she's been doing a great job so far. But you can also see the length of her arms and legs also allow her to walk upright. So that's one of the few things, or at least with her body above the ground. So that's one of the few turtles that's capable of doing that. That's very important because she doesn't want to drag the soft underside of her body, even though she does have that plastron underneath, which I'll give you a quick look at real quick. You guys can see how small it is down there. Much, much smaller than the top. Even though that part is hard, the flesh around it is still very vulnerable and is very prone to being injured if her body drags, especially on a hard surface. So if you ever encounter this animal, it's crossing the road, um, they typically do that during their breeding season. The females might go over a mile from water just to find an egg laying site, which is really incredible. Um, if you see this animal crossing the road, it's safe to do it. There's no cars, you wanna help them. Make sure you don't drag them. It really tears up their underside. The best way to do it, if you are very careful, only recommend this for adults, probably wear some gloves too, is by picking them up kind of like this where you have one hand on top, one hand on bottom. If need be, you can hold on to the shell as long as you still have your hand propping up the body. What you don't wanna do is hold on to just the tail. When you invert them like that, you can actually stretch out the spine. You'll see a lot of people handle them incorrectly like that. It's safe for you, it's not safe for them. Um, and again, this is more of a FYI. We are not encouraging you guys to go out in the wild and pick up snapping turtles. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you can see why that's not a good idea. But if you feel like they're in danger, you need to move one, it's safe for everybody involved. That's essentially how you would go about it. So Shelby's been doing a great job right now. She's probably pretty hungry too. We're gonna put her back in her tank in just a couple seconds and then we're gonna give her some food. I think Shelby, you've done a great job so far. All right guys, it's feeding time now. You can tell Shelby knows that there's some mice back there. So we have our roving naturalist, Matt, back there ready to give her some frozen tasty mice. So. That is what she eats primarily at the nature center. Um, she does eat fruit, like we mentioned, she is omnivorous. Um, but typically we're going to give her frozen dead mice that we thaw out each day. Um, typically about three a day, every three to four days throughout the week. So she eats quite a bit and she is always hungry, always ready to go. Um, snapping turtles, especially in the wild too, pretty voracious, love to eat. Um, so let's watch, let's tune in. So Matt's offering the first one now. <laughs> Sometimes she she's, sees a shadow on the tank and doesn't exactly know where it is, but eventually she does find it. There we go. And man, you can see how quickly she gets that. So as soon as she has it in her sight, she'll swim up using those powerful limbs. She has webbed feet as well to help propel herself through the water. But when she sees it, she'll swim right up and then she will grab it. And you can see just how fast that mouth is when she extends that neck and takes a snap with those jaws. And we'll include a slow motion video here too that you can see of her getting a better look at that. So um, once she's got the mouse, um, she really, especially if it's something that can be swallowed whole, she doesn't really use her claws. She doesn't rip at it, doesn't tear at it. She really is just going to swallow that mouse whole if possible, kind of like what a snake does. 
Um, now, unlike with a snake that might use its muscles to move the mouth around the mouse to try to, to get it down, um, what Shelby and the snapping turtles do uh, is they actually inhale water. So just like we do when we take a drink of water when we're eating food, they're gonna do that as well. Like we mentioned, they can only eat these animals, eat their food underwater uh, because they need the water to wash the food down for them. So that's what you see her doing right there. She's taking a big gulp of water. Sometimes you can even see her really open her mouth wide where it looks like she's yawning. That is her taking in a bunch of water trying to wash that food down. Um, and when she gets it down, she looks like she does, She's already back to looking up, looking around, seeing where her next meal is. Um, Matt actually has the mouse over here right now, so we'll see if Shelby eventually finds it, but right now she's kind of hiding out under. So Shelby, we have another mouse over there, bud. So Matt's kind of moving the mouse closer to her until she gets a good look at it. There we go. That's another great strike. So you can see just how fast that neck lunges out. Um, the length of the neck is pretty close to the length of the shell too. So very, very long neck can come out incredibly fast. Um, and these are ambush predators too. So kind of like what an alligator does, um, they're relative to alligator snapping turtle. It gets its name for a couple of reasons, but one of them is because of how they hunt. So just like your crocodilians, um, these are typically ambush predators. So they will wait until their prey gets close to them. They won't typically actively search for prey. They really will more kind of wait at the bottom of the pond or river, wait for their food to come within striking distance of them. And kind of like a snake does too, they'll wait for that animal to get close and then they'll lunge out with that long neck and grab it. And once she has it, she's going to bring it down under. She's going to swallow it whole if possible. If it's too big, she's going to use those claws to tear at it. But you can see Shelby has found a nice comfy spot behind her dock where she feels kind of secluded, has her privacy, um, and then she's going to start eating. So <laughs> she's kind of chowing down back there where we can't see her. So we're going to leave her to it, but we're going to give you guys an awesome slow motion video here in just a sec that shows you just how powerful that strike is. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to share with your friends and family. If you're not already doing so, be sure to follow Potomac Overlook Regional Park, Nova Parks, and Nova Parks Roving Naturalist on Facebook and Instagram. Stay tuned for more content.